Um, so I guess we'll get started. Okay, thank you. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, sometimes uh, repetition is good. So uh, just on everyone's behalf, I want to continue to thank Stuart Rosenthal, um, not just for organizing, but uh, especially for his uh, keeping to it. <laughs> and um, for, for whatever it's worth, I, I really want to thank all of you. It's something we spoke about last year, but, but I think it's also worth repeating every now and then. When a number of people come to something like this, I think it inspires and encourages everyone there. And then there's a, a greater, I, I think there's a more motivation and focus when there's more people there. So thank you everyone for coming. And I, I must confess, uh, those who know me well, I'm sure know by now that I'm a pretty big uh, pessimist. And part of me, when Stuart came and said, okay, let's have another series, Rabbi, part of me said, gosh, doesn't he know no one's going to come anymore? <laughs> and people are, 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 are sick and tired of this. But okay, how can I say no to Stuart? So I, I, I thank Stuart, but I really thank all of you for, for continuing to come. And for those who, who thought I was going to uh, share for three weeks the most exciting moments of my last vacation, I <laughs> apologize for disappointing you. Um, okay, um, so we're going to talk about Sukkot Zimra over these three weeks. Primarily, we're going to focus on Ashrei, but before then, we're really going to talk about Sukkot Zimra in general. I, I just want to take a moment to think about, imagine for a moment, if you had to describe to someone who was not familiar with Jewish prayer, if you had to describe the morning service to someone, I don't mean the structure of the morning service, I mean, what happens? What do you say? So, again, I'm sure people have wonderful ideas, but just to, to get moving a little bit, I'm sure people would say we ask God for things. What part of the document do we ask God for things? Just want to ask, right? I'm certainly asking. Uh, I'm sure people would say that we speak of uh, God's goodness and greatness, which is also in the Shmona Esrei. People might say that we say the Shema, it's Torah, it's for the sake of the Shema, to reflect on our devotion and dedication to God. You might even say that we talk about offerings that we can't bring, which is the very beginning of that one. You might say that we say blessings in the morning to thank God for all these capabilities that we have and sensations that we have when we get up in the morning, which is the problem all the way in the beginning of, of, of the morning davening, my guess is you wouldn't even touch on Sukkot Zimra. That, that's, that's my guess. And if a person would ask, okay, so what is Sukkot Zimra? Forgive the terminology, but probably the best thing we could say offhand is, I don't know, it's some kind of like warm-up for davening or something. <laughs> that's what it feels like. We spend a lot of time in that warm-up. A lot, a lot of time. Um, <laughs> So what, what's it all about? So th there's a lot to say. Um, I'm sure we could look at the entire Pesach of December in great detail. We're not going to do that because three weeks won't be enough for that. Uh, what I'd like to do tonight, like we've done in the past, we'll, we'll stop every now and then and kind of take questions and comments and things like that. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the, the goal of Pesach of Zimra in terms of why it was instituted and what, what the rabbis wants to do had in mind. I want to talk a little bit about the structure of Pesach of Zimra. And then I want to spend the rest of tonight speaking specifically about Ashrei. Okay, which is, as, as it'll make more sense as we discuss, Ashrei is the core of Pesach Zimra. Okay, there's a fascinating bar in the Sech HaShavis, that Kuf Yud Chesim Beis. Rabbi Yossi says, I would like to have my portion be with those who say Hallel every day. I, you know, I wish I could be so fortunate. If you'd like, by the way, there's a light, there's a light upstairs if you'd like, to make it more comfortable. Uh, there's a switch in the corner over there. Okay. Um, I, I wish my, my portion could be with those who say halal every day. The Gemara asks a question, it's a striking question. The Gemara says, yeah, but we say that if you say halal every day, you're considered to be cursing God. Which we'll get into that a little bit later, what the Gemara really means like that. But the Gemara explains that that's not what Rabbi Yossi meant. Rabbi Yossi didn't mean the halal that we say, um, Hanukkah and Rosh Chodesh and Pesach and all that. The Gemara explains that what Rabbi Yossi meant was Pesukhanism. Literally, so remember these verses of, of, of song, of, of praise to God. That if I was the type of person who would say it every day, I, I, I wish I would be the type of person who would say it every day. Um, the uh, commentators explain he doesn't mean page, uh, you know, 58 to uh, whatever in our scroll sitter. He means specifically Ashrei and five Halloweens. Now, the commentators also explain that it's not as easy as it sounds. In other words, wow, you know. I, I at least sometimes do that, say I'm straight at all five out Lucas, gosh, you know. Uh, but the point is to say it with real reflection and focus, that imagine every day 
First, you could say Ashrei. Some, some commentators say just talk about Ashrei. Right? First, it said every day Ashrei and Halukas with real focus. It, uh, basically, it's a ticket to Olam that, 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 That's the point. Uh, uh, a few comments about the value of Sukkot Zimra in general. There's a Tosfos and Mesech Esbrachos, Laflam and Aleph, who explains that we know that we need to come into davening with the feeling of COVID rush. COVID rush is a certain gravity for the importance of the moment. And Tosfos explains that that's why we say Pesukkot Zimra. In other words, if we wouldn't have Pesukkot Zimra, you just... Uh, Pop at the shul, everyone would say baruch when you get right into davening, and, and we'd be missing the kind of getting getting into the appropriate mode. The rush says something so interesting. Sometimes even if we can't relate to something, to just need to hear it, it inspires also. The rush says we want to come into the mitzvah of davening with a sense of simcha, a sense of joy, and what could arouse joy more than words of Torah? No, it's Pesuke Zimra, literally. You know, it's, I think most of the time people talk about Pesuke Zimra, they focus on the Zimra part, the songs of praise. Literally, Pesuke Zimra means verses. And it, again, if you scan through the Siddur, basically all of Pesuke Zimra, with a few exceptions, are verses from Tanakh. So it's just a fascinating thing to think about. You know, for example, the halacha is when a person, heaven forbid, a person is in Shiva. One of the restrictions of Shiva is they can't study regular parts of Torah. Why in the world can't they study regular parts of Torah? Because Torah is considered to bring joy to a person. So the rush says, we want to come into davening with a sense of joy for our ability to talk to God. So what better way than reading Sukkim relating to our relationship with God? It's a remarkable thing even to think about, you know. Um, the tour, when he talks about Sukkot Zimra, he says a person needs to recite Sukkot Zimra with a, a tune and a pleasantness because it's a beautiful song that we sing to God. He speaks, speaks specifically about Rosh Hashanah, which is the beginning of Sukkot Zimra, that appoints to the Sukkot Zimra. It's a whole, a whole different way of thinking about things. Let's talk a track about the structure of Sukkot Zimra. Um, it might be easiest if you follow along with me, if you'd like to. It's in the arts, I'm in the Arts World English on page 58. And whether you're a brown or black type of person in terms of the covers, it's the same pagination. So, uh, page, uh, page 58. The beginning of Pesukah Zimra is, is a bracha. Baruch Shemar is its fila. That's a long bracha. We'll talk about that a little more in a moment. That's the beginning of Pesukah Zimra. The end of Pesukah Zimra, a lot of people don't realize this, the end of Pesukah Zimra is on page 82 in the Yard Scroll, which is Yishtabah. It's very ironic. We, you know, when, when Minyan switch, so the Chazan gets up at Yishtabach. So in our mind, oh, Pesukah Zimra is over, now it's Shachas. Really, Yishtabach is the end of Pesukah Zimra, and the real end of it, as you see at the very end of Yishtabach, Baruch HaTo HaShem, Kel Melech Kedom Etishbachos, et cetera, Melech Kel Chayo Lamim, that's a bracha. So Baruch HaOmar, the end of Baruch HaOmar was, Baruch HaTo HaShem, Melech Mulal Batishbachos, and the end of Yishtabach is, is another bracha. These are the bookends to Pesukah Zimra. That's the beginning and end of Pesukah Zimra, and I don't want to get too bogged down by technicalities, but some people don't even realize we're halakhically prohibited from speaking um, from the time we finish Baruch Sha'amar, certainly through Yishtabak, but then you're not allowed to talk again, but uh, because unless it's relating to tefillah, because we're in the middle of something that we're saying a bracha on. That's, that's the, the basic idea. Now, after Baruch Sha'amar, we have all these Sections. There's a fascinating thing. The Re Bar Yatar, among others, says there are ten selections of verses in the Pesukah Zimra section, in the heart of the Pesukah Zimra section. We have to modify that in a second. The first selection is on page 60. Hodu Lashem Kiru Bishma. That runs on 60 through the middle of page 62. And this is from the very young from Chronicles. And this was a praise of God that David Amel composed, that King David composed. Number one. There's a collection of Pesukim after that, that's sort of the postscript to hope. We're not really going to focus on that. Number two is on page 64. Mizmor Lesoda. These are also verses from Tehillim. I, I know I've, I've shared this joke with you before. There was a 
person who once came to his rabbi and said, give me an interesting thing to study. So he said, you know, to heal him, Psalms is a fascinating thing to study. It's a fellow studies, comes back to the rabbi and says, how'd you like it? He says, I'm really not impressed. The rabbi says, why not? He says, King David just stole things out of the sitter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, so Ms. Morlisoga is on page 64 in the middle, and this is the, the, the description of the experience of bringing a Thanksgiving offering to God. Just a technical point for a moment. We don't say Ms. Morlisoga on days of the calendar that you wouldn't be eligible to bring a Thanksgiving offering. So on Shabbos and Yom Tiv, when, when there are prohibited acts which God mandates to be done on a given day, there's a daily court that you bring on Shabbos. That involves Torah defined law, Torah defined work. But God said to do it, so we do it. But an optional offering that involves uh, different types of law and different types of normal work prohibited on Shabbos and Yom Tiv, it's not our place to bring it on Shabbos and Yom Tiv. So we don't say Ms. Morris Soda on Shabbos and Yom Tiv. We don't say Ms. Morris Soda on Pesach. Because the Toda offering involved loaves, involved chavits. So they weren't allowed to bring a Toda offering during Pesach. But in any event, Ms. Morla Soda, so if we're talking about ways that we relate to God, one of the ways that we relate to God is we give thanks to Him. So this is the second thing. It has to do with, with the perspective of a Thanksgiving offering. The third is really um, a general collection of Pesukim. This is really from all over. Uh, primarily from Tehillim, of course. Yehi Chor Hashem Leolam, that's number three. Then we have six chapters. Six chapters of Tehillim, <coughs> Ashrei and the five Halukas, and this is very worthwhile to note, they are the final six chapters of Psalms. So this was, David HaMelech ended off Psalms with great expression of praise to God. We say the entire conclusion every day of davening. So we're at, for those keeping score, we're at, we're at number nine right now. We had three, then, then six, Ashwin, the Bible, which is nine. Skipping ahead to page 74, we have Baruch Hashem, the Olam, Umein, the Umein. That is normally understood as being a postscript to the Halukas. Basically, um, the Kolbo, for example, no, I'm sorry, the Udraham, Explains that after we've closed out Tehillim, we just want to talk about how blessed we are, how how, how blessed we look at God is. So that's like a, a, a like a, a postscript to the closing out Tehillim. And then number ten is Vayvarat David. Yeah, this is one more selection also from Chronicles, where David expressed his appreciation of God for the Jewish people. That's ten. What in the world is the significance of ten here? So the read by Yaakov among others says, you know famously, that God created the world with 10 declarations. And so therefore, if we're going to begin now with a basic expression of our thanks to God, we highlight the fact that he created the world. Now, there's a lot of discussion as to why these 10. So we could spend the rest of the night on this, and I don't want to. I just want to give you a, a, a little a little bit of, of a taste really, really quickly. So the first creation of God was the heaven. That's what we traditionally say. So there are a number of verses in the Hodu section, the first of the 10, that talk about the greatness of the skies and the heaven. So they have, they have parallels. Um, the second is Mismor the Soda, ultimate thanksgiving to God. The second declaration of God which created the world was the creation of light. So that's considered to be, you know, what? What great, what like what could be a greater thing to express our thanks for than light? If you don't know what I'm talking about, think of this next time there's a blackout. Um, the the third is is our, in Yichvo. I'm sorry, not in Yichvo. In Ashrei, Arumimcha Elokai Hamelach. I will elevate you, my God, the King. The third declaration was the creation of dry land. And I can only elevate you if I have the ability to stay in a secure place. I, I don't want to get too, too bogged down, but this is the gist. And before I should discuss, but the point is, each of these 10 is supposed to match up in some way to one of the declarations of the creation of the world. And that's why we have 10. 
that's, that's how it's explained. Now, if you're keeping score, we're basically at page 78. Page 78, Vayosha Hashem Vayom Ahu, and then famously, Oz Yashir. We've gotten to 10. So, Rebbe Yochur explains that if we're citing all of these verses, how could we not cite verses from the Torah itself about expression of our thanks to God? And the ultimate expression of thanks to God in the Chumash is the, the song of praise to God. It's still in the sea. So, Vayosha Hashem are the introductory psukim to the, the, the song of praise after the splitting of the sea. So we say that section. The Abu Dhraham actually explains that there are 15 languages of praise in Yishtabach. Yishtabach is very unusual. That's the brother. That is the brother. 15 languages of praise. And he says those 15 languages of praise are based on lessons from the Pesukim of Baibar and Dabin and from the Pesukim of Abaz Yashir. So that's why we close off with these sections. This is just, I just want to give you a general piece. So again, what we're saying is Baruch Shammar is the bracha that begins Pesukim of Zimra. Yishtabach is the bracha that ends Pesukim of Zimra. There are 10 sections of praise um, uh, to God that touch on one way or another his creation of the world that it is the middle of Pesukim of Zimra. And, we, and, and before we actually end up Pesukim with Yishtabach, we talk about the Pesukim of the song of praise that you sang to God in Spilom that, That's the basic idea. Now, people might be wondering, again, we can talk so much more about all this, but I just want to keep moving. You ever wonder why the Shabbos Pesukim is what it is? No, it's, it's, I, I always assumed it was because we have, I needed more time to think about a sermon. So, like, um, so, so first of all, um, Ms. Weather Sold is missing. We, we, we discussed that already. But there's all these additional chapters that, that are, are, are stuck in. So there are seven additional chapters that are stuck in the Shabbos of Sukkot Zimra. If you want to look, it's on page 374. <coughs> so the Re Bar Yachar explains the reason why we stick in seven additional uh, chapters is because there's a pasuk sheva vayom hilal ficha. I will praise you seven times in the day. So we want to say extra expressions of praise to God on Shabbos, and seven seems to be an appropriate number. But there's another reason, of course, why we would say seven additional prayers on Shabbos. Because Shabbos is the seventh day. Extremely briefly, the Rebbe Yagar explains that each of the seven additional psalms that we say of Shabbos match up to one of the seven days of creation. So, for example, on 374, the second verse, Hashemayim Yisachrin, Kvot Kael, the heavens speak of the greatness of God. The heavens were created on the first day. Second, um, the second verse on page 376 of the new psalm is, Avorah Es Hashem, Bechol Es, I will bless God at all times, and he says that kind of matches up with the idea of Bayer by Boker, you know, when it was, it was night, it was dead. Um, we have Tefila Lamoshe on page 378, and one of the verses in there is, Ma'on ha'yisalanu l'dor v'dor. You have created this abode for us, generation for generation. That matches up with the creation of the firmament. So that was sort of like for the abode of God so on and so forth. And obviously, the seventh and concluding one is, look on the page, 388, is <coughs> So just an interesting, interesting thing to think about. Okay, I want to just touch on one more point and then we'll open it up to any questions or comments before going on. So why do we start and end with the bracha, by the way? <coughs> why do we do that? You, you, you tell me you want me to say Asher and the Halukas, I'll say Asher and the Halukas. You tell me you want to say tens and sevens, I'll say that too. What, what another bracha you need? <coughs> so the Torah's Mincha explains that 
what do we do when we read from the Torah itself? When a person gets an aliyah, what happens? Make a brah before you make a brah after. Because that's the greatness of, of reading from Hashem's Torah. By the way, even if you already said the brachos on the Torah earlier that day, right? You know, you open the sitter in the morning to bring the Torah, they give you an aliyah and show you still say bring the Torah. Again, because there's this great experience. So that's how we look at Pesukim Zimra. That just even saying these quote-unquote simple Pesukim that we say every day, it's such a, a, an extraordinary experience that we say a bracha before and after. And, he says, how many types of blessing of God do we express when you get an aliyah? Depends on you count. Four. You know, like a, you know, the, the, the pre aliyah bracha sort of begins with the baruch, ends with the baruch. The post aliyah bracha begins with the baruch, ends with the baruch. How many languages of praise to God do we say between baruch shamar and yishtab? So many more. So he says, you learn from that that the, the remarkable sensation we have about being able to express this to God should be more from Sukkot Zimra, that we're all just sitting here with our simple Siddur, than from getting reading from the Torah itself. Interesting thing. Just one more point from the, uh, the Balatanya. Let Rabbi Bobovsky not think that he didn't make an impact on our group. Uh, the Balatanya, the famous uh, the Babashar authority, Babashar Rebbe, um, he has a, a very interesting idea. There he says there are 10 languages of blessing in Baruch Shemar. In other words, there are 10, it says the word Baruch 10 times in Baruch Shemar. And that's supposed to match up to the 10 declarations with which the world was created. Because whenever we say praise to God, the most basic of praise is that we're all here in the first place. That we're all here and look at this remarkable world in which we live. We'll pause for a some comments, questions, and then we'll go on to Ashray itself. Any, any comments, questions? Okay? Yeah? It's interesting that you said that the Baruch Shamar has the same. Right. <laughs> it's, 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 uh, this is the process to get us into that mode, and yeah, fair enough. Okay? Yeah. Is there a particular reason why uh, the, the verse of the is seen this way as a full for instance? These are separate baruch. They are not two brachas technically. But why not to arrange them in new light, each of them? So to emphasize, for instance, the fact that it is distinct. Do you mean in terms of the, the, the pagination, or do you yes. mean in terms of the words? Yes, yes pagination. Yes. Pagination? Uh, honestly, I, my, my guess is the printers were, were worried that you'd think it was too long. Mm -hmm. uh, but but I, I think, you, you know, I want to tell you something. There's a remarkable... Um, Rabbi, uh, those of you who remember Rabbi Katzenstein, who was here just only a, you know, a year or so ago, um, he, he gave me as a gift once, he had printed up for one of his kids' weddings, somebody had done the work, but he printed up a bencher that just reorganized the words of the benching and, and organized them out based on like the themes. The words were all the same, but just sort of like you know, the page was different, and, and there was more spacing and structuring, and, and it's a different experience to bench. Absolutely. You know, so it's so I, I hear what you're saying, Gregory. I mean, you know, but it's, uh, I don't know. I think you remember seeing this somewhere, but I cannot remember when. I think I think yeah. I Anyone know a sitter that sort of breaks up the words of Baruch Shalom more? Cor Cor what? Cor 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 I was wondering, yeah. Corn Cor sacks, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. You don't have a price for them, do you? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Anything else before we go on? Okay. So, Ashray itself. Let's, uh, we'll go very slow here. Have some time. Uh, page 66, and the goal is not to get to Ashray tonight. We'll, we'll get through some of Ashray. But before we actually go to the actual words of Ashray, just as, as a little bit of a means of an introduction, there's another Gemara. So, we had a Gemara in Shabbos that spoke about the great merit of saying Sukkot Zimra every day, and clearly with, with meaning and, and thought and feeling. This Gemara in Brachos. Gemara in Brachos. Dalin Base says, Famous, famous Gemara. They had a person who says, Tihilala David. By the way, we'll see in a moment. Uh, we call it Ashrei. It's really, really a misnomer to call it Ashrei. Uh, it's, it's a chapter in Tehillim, the 145th chapter of Tehillim. Ashrei Yoshbe Gesekh Vagel Lukasel Ashrei Yom Shekakal Ashrei Yom Shekakal Ashrei Yom are not there. They're elsewhere in Tehillim. Um, the first words of the chapter of 145 of Tehillim are Tihilala David. 
So maybe we'll talk a little bit about why we deal with Ashrei. But, but in any event, the Gemara says a person who says to heal a Lubavit three times a day, you know, is sure to be a person of Olam Haba. Again, clearly the meaning here is, again, with, with real meaning and feeling. So the significance of three times a day would seem to be because we have three davenings during the day. We actually don't say Ashrei in Mariv, but we say Ashrei twice in Chakras, and we say Ashrei in Minfa, so we, we, we do it three times a day. So the Gemara asks, why are you so um, sold on the greatness of Ashrei? What's that about? So just to make a long story short, the Gemara says there's two unique things about Ashrei. One unique thing about Ashrei is that it's an Aleph Bay's organization, famously uh, known as not present. We'll talk about that in the end. Got long, but it's organized by Aleph, by, by the order of Aleph Bay's. And the significance of that is it's, it's, it's saying, like, wow, like sort of, we would say, Mahat the Lynch would say, you know, I praise you from A to Z, like, you know, in all aspects, you know, the, so every letter of the alphabet. And there's a pasuk that emphasizes how much God takes care of our basic needs. Of all, of all the creations of this world. You provide satiation to every living form to what extent they need. And so that combination makes Ashrei remarkable to you. And that's why Ashrei is the core of Sukkot Zimra. Maybe later on the series we'll talk a little bit about some of the technicalities of let's say a person comes late. I say all the time, that's one of the aspects of halacha. I'm very expert in what happens when you come late to show. But, um, but the, basically the bottom, bottom line of Sukkot Zimra is Baruch Amar Yishtach, learn. Those are the bookends. That's the bracha that begins with the bracha that ends it. And Ashram. That's what it's all about. That's really the core. Rabbi Yona asks a very basic question. If you remember, we started with the Gemara and Shabbos. The Gemara said that uh, Rabbi Yossi had said, I, I, I wish I could have the portion of those who say hallow every day. If you want to say hallow every day, it's considered blasphemous to say hallow every day. So we're saying, no, 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 I don't mean hallow, I mean sukkotism. So Rabbi Yona asks, oh, okay, fine. Why is Ashrei so much better than hallow? Halal will tell me it's a terrible thing to say halal every day. Only on special days you should say halal. Ashrei? Say it every day. Say it three times every day. What's the difference? Praise is praise. What, what's the... And why is it so bad to say halal every day? I would think God would be proud of me to say halal every day. Mr. Yonis says a remarkable thing. I, I mean, he, he lays out more than what I'm about to say, but just sort of to, to simplify it a little bit. Mr. Yonis says, what's halal about? If you had to explain to someone what Halil is about, if you look at Halil in, in context, and look at the commentators, Halil is basically about what happened to the Jewish people. The great things that happened to the Jewish people, emphasis on past tense. More than anything else, Halil is about the Exodus from Egypt. Okay. You know what Ashrei is about? Ashrei is about how we benefit from God right now, as, as we'll see as we go through. And it's also about the eternity of God. If you spend every day talking about how wonderful things once were, there's a lot of good that could come from talking about how wonderful things once were. It gives us perspective. But if every day your emphasis <laughs> is how great things were, For us. It's not just that he did great things for us. He does great things for us. And not only does he do great things for us, he always will do great things for us. Hallel is essential periodically. Because however much I, I, I talk about, wow, I wouldn't be able to eat today without God, that's very important. And we need to remember that every day. We need to remember that more than once every day. But every now and then we need this bigger, broader more bright, wow, imagine how God took the Jews out of Egypt. But not every day. The periodic memory of that gives us a different perspective. But it, it's, it's a very, it's a very interesting, this is the perspective of the This is what's so special about Ashrei. Ashrei is rooted in present and future. And Hallel is rooted in past. That's an interesting thing. Um, touch on this 
in a few minutes, God willing, but the, the commentator, um, say the Ladera, says that the real punchline of Ashrei, and particularly this idea of the eternity mentioned within Ashrei, is what's different about God's kingdom from any other dominion in this world is the eternity of God's kingdom. And it's, you know, mighty kingdoms, mighty kings rise and fall. God is the only king that's eternal. That, that, and we'll see different references to that uh, through Ashrei, God willing. Um, okay. So let's let's go, let, let's talk a little bit about, again, I'm on page 66 in the Art Scroll English. So where it's really at is the beginning of, of, of chapter 145, which begins with Tila David. So why do we say this Ashrei Yoshve Meseth in the first place? The, these first two verses are from Tehillim, are from Psalms. But they're not from this chapter of Psalms. So there's a Tosis and Brachos, that Lamed Beis, Lamed Beis, that says as follows The Gemara learns a very important concept from this first Pasuk. Ashrei Yoshvei Beisepa, Od Yahalalu Pasel. Fortunate, praiseworthy are ones who dwell in your house, they will praise you further. The Gemara learns from this Pasuk that before one davens, one needs to take time to reflect before they die. So as you see, you, you know, there's pro, praise where you are those who dwell in your house, it sort of connotes whether literally sitting down or, or just sort of like being there. And then once they're there, they'll praise you further. So if this is the core of what this whole section of Daven is about, to kind of put us into that mode, doesn't it make sense that we give that pasuk which speaks about the value of reflection before this core part of preparation of tefillah. That, 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 that's what Tosis explains. Um, okay, that, that, that handles the first passing for us. What about the second passing? You know, and, and the shame is you can't even say that they were consecutive. They are approximately um, 60 chapters apart from the book of Psalms. So it's not going to work very well. Uh, so uh, a common understanding is if you look at the two psukim together, how many times does it say Ashrei? Three. It says three Ashrei three times in the first two psukim. So this gets back to this idea that we're supposed to say this tefillah three times a day. Again, it, it certainly is meaningful because what Ashrei Rav Schwab comments that Ashrei, we translate Ashrei as this praise word, that's so I translate it into English here, but Rav Schwab says the real point is, is how joyful we should be that we have this opportunity. It, it, it's, a very, it's, a very nice, it's a very nice thing to think about. You know, I, I, I had um, a little bit of interesting experience when we were on vacation. I guess I am going to talk about vacation. We were on vacation. Um, I had uh, more davening duty with one of my kids uh, than I normally do. Normally either the wonderful patient teachers at school handle it, and on off days normally my wife handles it. Um, so it's wonderful, you know, the davening, my, my son was davening, he was taught in school, and a lot of the things that he does in school, they do it in songs. And it happens to be a number of the tefillos they do in songs are, are uppity, moving songs. And, and I, I think he started, I don't think it was my idea, but I don't know if they do this in school or not, I, I didn't ask him, but I found that we, a number of the times that we sang, we sort of danced to some of these different tunes. And the, the Rebbe is an excellent Rebbe, and he makes very uppity tunes. And, and I, and, you know, at first I was dancing with him because it was a way to get through it. You, you know, like he seemed that, okay, it's good enough, we'll do it. You know? And then the more time that passed, the more I realized, wow, this is what you want. The, the idea that as we, you know, just a kid, he doesn't really understand what he's saying, but the basic idea that the way we relate to God in prayer is with this sense of joy, it, it's a remarkable thing to think about. And that's really the point that Schwab makes, that we, we emphasize this word ashray, you know, how fortunate we are. Um, I, I, uh, I mentioned this before in Shul. I, I once was with a group of, of educators and we were talking to a very well-respected educator who focuses on children who have sort of been turned off from Judaism and trying to get them 
back in Bali, back on. And we were sitting with him and we asked him, okay, you, you see the, the problem at its greatest, uh, one of its greatest points. What should we be, what are we not doing enough of? You know, we, the, the broader educational world. He says, the one thing you have to make sure to bring home to your kids, to your students, so much, is how fortunate they are to be Jews. Except that, again, and not just the lip service, obviously. And I think we can intuitively understand that. But we can't forget ourselves in that message either. Forget our kids, forget our students. Do we feel that we're, we're really fortunate? And again, I'm, I'm not saying from an educational perspective for ourselves. If we intuitively understand that our children will benefit from that message, do we impart that message to ourselves ever? It's just, I think, a worthwhile thing to think about. Um, okay, just to complete this thought, if you skip ahead to page 68, I hope people don't leave too scandalized, but the last verse of Ashray was also not from this psalm. Yeah. Um, <coughs> the last verse of Ashray is Tilasa Shemitabra Pivi Borei Kobosar Shem Kachal Yom Mavoyadish. But remember, it's all about Aleph Tav, so Tav is the last letter. So the last verse is Vanah Mavorei Kachal Yom Mavoyadish. Vanah Mavorei Kachal Yom Mavoyadish. We'll bless God forever, praise God. It's also a verse from elsewhere in Psalms. Why do we even say this? Why is this here? So we explained the two Ashray verses at the beginning. Good. What's this doing here? So this, the, the, the commentary Haman here explains, well, look at the next five chapters. I mean, if you look to page 70 for a moment, the next section begins with the word Hallelujah and ends with the word Hallelujah. And that's how the next one, that's how the halukas go. So we're going into the halukas. So as a lead into the halukas, we, uh, we add on a verse to the end of, of Ashrei that also ends with halukah, praise God. Very, very practical reason. The Sefer Oruch Oschayim asks such a basic question on this. Um, how many times do we say Ashrei a day again? Read. How many times do we say it in conjunction with the halukas? Once. How many times do we say Manat Mubarak Kabe Atom Yad Alam Al Muka a day? Three. <laughs> so, is it just to be in good practice? I mean, it's, it's, it's a, little, a little strange, a little bit difficult to understand. So, the Orthos Time says there's a whole different reason why, why we say this last verse. You know, Ashray is all about how much we need God and, and how, desperate, how desperate we are without God. And, and in a sense, um, the, the most basic of those psukim is the verse of Poseach, so that must be a chaimet song. You open your hand and, and you give things to all life. You know, if you think too much about that, it gets a little depressing. It, it, it gets invigorating and inspiring, but every now and then, especially if you're saying it three times a day, and really thinking about it, by the way, it gets a little depressing. It's hopeless. I, you know, I, I, I can't do anything. It's wonderful that God takes care of me, but who am I? So he suggests the practice in clouds for us. We end off. You know something? Because we cultivate this relationship with God, because we say these praises to God, we'll merit for all eternity to be blessing Him. You know, presumably the way to look at it is, is you know, our souls will live on. We, we might not be as independent as we'd like to be in this world, but we're far more eternal than we ever imagined that we are in the next world. And so we suggest that it's a little bit of a chizm. It's a little bit of a, of a bucking ourselves up after focusing on how helpless we are in this world. It's a very interesting perspective. Any questions? Come from Judy. Okay, well, first thing, like, um, you're talking about this potential for death. I was thought that Hashem desired you know what? I'll, I'll tell you what, Judy, I'm sorry. What we're going to do, I, 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 I'm just misleading a little bit because I sort of jumped back and forth. We're going to go through very clearly each puzzle over these coming weeks. Maybe if you don't mind waiting for that, we'll, we'll get there, okay? All right, so my second question, yeah, that, that's my thing in the conjunction of those two things. Yeah. The second question, <coughs> in the benching, the first paragraph, okay, it's in parentheses, and I've been told it's Sephardic, um, uh -huh. I say it, because I, it has meaning to me about it. So why do we say in the first paragraph, bench, prepare for the death? I think for those who say it, I think the idea is because it really is what we're talking about. 
Kabur, as it is said, the Hosea is not going to have its own, kind of his hand, and he gives all oh, what they need. That's, that's the punchline of what we're talking about in the first, in the first, uh, the first blessing of the benching. So we say, you know, as, as we're talking, so that's the point. Yeah. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, let, let's just go a little bit. Stuart, what time did you have in mind for ending? Eight. Eight. So let's, so let's begin to go through the actual psukim. Um, I'm again on page 66. Ashrei Yoshvei Vesev. Fortunate are those who sit in your house. I, I actually didn't translate that so well just now. Um, if you had to say those who sit in your house, I, probably if we would think about it, we would say Yoshvim Vesev. Yoshvei Vesev is a little bit of a different thing. Yoshvei Vesev is a smichus, right? It's a, it's a connection of two. So Yosh, literally this means the, 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 the sitters of your house. Not in your house. Of your house. That's, that's the grammar here. You remember, is everybody with me? So what's that even mean, the sitters of your house? So Rav Shamshin Rafal Hirsch says, and by the way, which house are we talking about exactly? What are we talking about? I mean, what, 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 what would, at its most basic level, what we call the house of God, what would we say? Face of Mikdash, right? So, does David Amalek mean the, the ideal mode of Klaus Ross to stay sit ins in the face of Mikdash? <coughs> Doesn't seem that that's how we did it. So, what's he even talking about? So, Rav Hirsch says, because of those two points, Rav Hirsch says that the shot and the puzzle is, the way we look at the puzzle is, not sitters, but for lack of better terminology, residence. But not physically, because again, you didn't, you didn't have people who lived full time in the base of the Israel. People who are, are always dwelling in the house of God. You know, there's, um, there's a, a, a famous letter from Rabbi Yitzchak of blessed memory. He had, a, I mentioned this before also, he had a student who wrote him a very painful letter that he had had such inspiring times in yeshiva, and then after he left yeshiva, he felt like he was leading a double life. He felt like, you know, when he would go to shul, when he would go to a class, when he would have a chabrusa, he was like serving God, a uh, religiously worthwhile life, and then when he would go to work, he was sort of like something else. <coughs> and Rav Hutton told him, you're looking at it all wrong. He said, you have to see life as one big house person eats their meals in the dining room and sleeps in the bedroom, they're not living a life of contradiction. Are they dining room people or are they bedroom people? It's all under one roof. So the point is, two people can hold the exact same schedule. And, one, and, and two people can do a lot of mitzvahs in a day. And one person can be living a divinely inspired and guided life and one person, and this is not bad at all, but one person can be doing a lot of good things and a lot of powerful things. It's, it's a whole different attitude, but a yosh, a yosh, yosh be secha, are people who every moment of their lives, whether they're doing what's ostensibly the most spiritual or whether what they're doing what's ostensibly mundane, they're always, so to say, in God's house. That's, that's, that's making sense. Did, that, did I say that clearly or did it not? So that's how we first understand the Yosh Vegas Secha. So, and again, imagine to just reflect on that. Imagine to reflect on that three times a day. Yeah, it doesn't matter what I'm doing. It doesn't matter if, 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 if I'm sitting in traffic, bumper to bumper, doing nothing, and I can somehow keep my cool, and I can tell myself that this is, this is part of what I'm supposed to be as a human being also, I'm also in God's house. It could be anything. As long as, 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 as I, I live my life with a certain purpose in the moment. In the moment. Mm. Kathy, is that what you say in the moment? Right? From Sunday morning, right? That's the way we uh, Okay, so, so, Ashrei Yoshvei Meisecha. So, fortunate are those who are dwellers of your house. O Yahu Chasela. They'll continue to praise you. 
people who can have that experience, whatever is happening in life, will be able to find the opportunity to, to sing praises to God. Ashrei ha'am shakachalom. Fortune is the nation that this is its lot. Ashrei ha'am shashem lukav. Fortune is the nation that Hashem is its God. And that to view our connection with God as not only on a personal level, but to view our connection with God as being very much connected to the national level, it's a very powerful thing too. Tilal David. So now this is actually the beginning of, of, of chapter 145 in Tehillim. So praise of David. This is the, 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 the Compilation of praise. David, this is of course connected to the word hallelujah. Hallelujah means praise God. Tila means praise. And so basically he begins these last six chapters with this phrase. The last six chapters will now be all about appropriate praise of God. Aromimcha Elokai Hamelech. What a strange word. I will raise you. That's the Imagine if you wanted to express thanks to someone. What would be the first word you would use? Uh, well, right, thanks, right? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you're great. You're wonderful. You're high? What, what, is, what, a strange, what a strange thing to say. The Radak says that the, the Pshad is that I recognize that you are loftier than all other forces in this world. So I come out of the box, I, I, the first words out of my mouth are, I don't begin to understand what you do for me and what you do in this world. And that's how I need to begin the conversation. But by the way, what literally means I will lift you. What does that mean anyway? What does God Give me God a pep talk or something? Like, what, what does that mean? Exalt you, but, but I'm saying, but, 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 but quite literally. You know, so the Radak says that I will come, which is really like exalt, I guess, I will come to recognition in my own heart. That I will create an understanding in my own heart and mind that you are so much loftier than anything in this world. So another interesting point is. Elokai, my God. The Radak says, of course, you're not only my God. You're, you're, the, you're the, the God of the entire universe. But as I raise you, you become more my God. There's this more meaningful relationship between us. And I will bless your name forever. We start off, I will raise you. And then we say, I will bless your name. You know, so the first part talks about you, and the second part talks about your name. What, what, what's that about? So the Malam explains, first of all, the language of bracha. Again, we've spoken about this before. Blessing, forgive me, is not such a good translation. That's what we all said. But, you know, it, I, I want to say a bracha, so I, God bless you. And, and, and so is God more blessed? I mean, what does that mean? So what bracha really, really means is the language of abundance. So I recognize the abundance which you shower upon me. Every time I make a bracha, it's, 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 a, it's a verbal recognition on my part, and hopefully an emotional recognition, that everything that I have is from God. Now, the Malam explains, I, I can't... I, I can't begin to understand you, God. You're beyond me. That's what we said in the first part of the verse. I, I have to lift you up very high and exalt you. Shame, a name, is something by which a person is known. Right? So I can look at what you do for me. I can look at what you do in this world, at least the parts that I recognize, the parts that I can call by name, so to say, and I can recognize how much comes from you. I can't, I can't really, when I'm really thinking about it, I can't recognize how much come, how much you are, but I can recognize, to a limited extent, how much you give. 
It's different. Google it, okay? Just technically for a moment, um, so I'm going to bless you forever. How about how much time do we have in this world already? What does that mean? <coughs> so, a very interesting, to, to me, this is always an eye opener. Radak says, you're reading the Pasuk wrong, at least one possibility. I will bless your name, and your name is eternal. It's not that I'm blessing you eternally, it's that I'm blessing your eternal essence. That, that, that's one way to understand the Pasuk. Um, another possibility that Radak says, is everything is relative. So forever means all the days of my life. That, that's uh, another chapter of the says. And finally, the Rodak suggests the possibility that if I work in this world on exalting you, then I'll merit that my soul will continue to sing your praises even after my body leaves this world. And that truly my soul will continue to praise you, really for eternity. That's, uh, it also, it, you know, it sort of speaks to this idea a little bit too, when we um, we say that man is created with seven other kin. Man is created in the likeness of God. What is that? What is that? What is that? A lot of discussion among the commentators. Uh, I believe it's a Sforno. The Sforno says that what Elohim actually means is that Elohim means eternity. And I'm simplifying what he says, but this is at least the basic point. And that God created man that through our souls we really can live eternally. Not, not in this world, but we can do good deeds in this world in a way that, that our souls continue to benefit in, in the world to come. So it's the difference you know, if, if we're trying to be a little more reflective, to not only think about God and how much we owe God, but to think about ourselves and, and, and sort of what we're here for and, and we really can be eternal if that we only focus ourselves appropriately in this world. Yeah, Debbie? So a, a little bit of a, of a confession, we're jumping back and forth in different versions, so sometimes things don't perfectly fit. Um, I think you're referring to the Malvin. So the Malvin said that, uh, I, don't, I don't know you, God. I, I, you're beyond me. So all I can really relate to is what I see from you. So your name is what I call you. So what I recognize of you in this world, all I can do is I can point out all the abundance that I see that you bring to this world. I can't bless you, I can bless your name. So the first thing I remember, I'll, I'll just hold you up lawfully. I know I can't do anything, but I have to try. I will focus at least on what I see. If the purpose here is to bring us to a vision of what eternity is, Yeah, I, I, I think, yeah, I think it's a very interesting point. I, I, I think, I think, I mean, we will see that we, as it continues, he does do, do that to a certain extent. I think the, the, what he's getting at at the beginning, I think, is that we have to have a certain frame of mind. Um, you know, two people can see the exact same episode and have very different viewpoints on it. So I think he's sort of saying the more we become reflective, great, grateful people to God, if we start that way, we'll appreciate more. I think that's the point. It's an interesting point. I think so. I think so. Okay. Just some more Asher. Uh, they translate it here praiseworthy. Yeah. Is it praiseworthy or it's a fortunate? Which there is a change in tone a little bit. Lay a hold for some Asher, which meant fortunate, unconditional, and not praiseworthy. It's the same word. Here they, for some reason, can say praiseworthy. Fortunately, <coughs> you receive everything and no merit. Praiseworthy is a little bit good of your... So. That's interesting. It's a very interesting. Um, 
if we weren't uh, tethered to translations, I would agree with you. I, I think you're right. I think, the, like, I think it's fortunate. I, I, that's how I would think of it. Um, your proof from the Pusk, by the way, I think is a very, uh, it's a very valid proof. I, and that, I think, fits into what Rav Shab was talking about before. We're just so, we're just so fortunate. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's remarkable to just, to just think You know, we're, we're living, and I, I don't mean this in any way disrespectful to any other human being on this planet, but we believe that we have so much more perspective, so much more limited understanding, so many people around us. I, uh, you know, I'm repeating myself so many times, but I, I, I once, the first Rosh Hashanah, then I actually still, I did Rosh Hashanah and Kippur still in Bethesda. We were already living here in Capitol. So it was like Arab Rosh Hashanah afternoon. And we're driving back to the house in Bethesda from, from our home in Capitol. And um, we were driving to downtown Bethesda. I didn't normally hang out in downtown Bethesda 15 minutes before Yom Tov. I had, you know. And it, it was just so remarkable to me. I'm in bumper to bumper traffic. And I see people wandering up and down the streets of downtown Bethesda. And here I am on the way to recognize the anniversary of the creation of man, the, the master of the universe. And all these people walking up and down the street, they have no idea what, what's about to happen. Again, I, I don't mean it in a condescending way. I mean it in how, how remarkable it is that we have this perspective. And I, I think that's really, Ashley, it's just so remarkable what we have. And, and to have the opportunity to express that is awesome. And to have the opportunity to express that and that the master universe cares, and the master universe is interested in my expressing it, is remarkable. And, and to think about that three times a day. Maybe we'll hold here, and uh, God, willing, God willing, next week, I, I really do plan on getting through this <laughs> in, in two more weeks, and, and hopefully we'll have some time to either talk about some other halachs of Sukkot Zimra, maybe talk a little more about Shabbat Shabbat, but at a bare minimum, we'll get through Ashram the next week. Thank you very much.